Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 8. We're looking at the entire chapter today, title of our study, The Power of Jesus, Part 1. Matthew 8, The Power of Jesus, Part 1. Matthew 8 and 9 will walk us through 10 notable miracles of our Lord Jesus, each demonstrating his power and his authority. We'll see clearly he has the might and he has the right to do things no one else was doing in his generation. We'll also see his compassion and his concern and his care, his tenderness towards suffering people, his power over disease, over nature, over demons. Today, we'll consider a few of those notable miracles, beginning with the cleansing of a leper and ending with the legion of demons who end up being the first case of deviled ham. So uh, we're going to dig into all that. Chapter 8, verse 1, take a look. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed, and Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Lepers in that day suffered in every possible way. The disease deformed them physically. It alienated them socially. It defiled them spiritually, rendering them unfit and unable to fellowship with the saints of God, to, to worship in his temple, to offer uh, sacrifices, to, to attend the feast and festivals. You couldn't serve. You couldn't fellowship. You couldn't worship, at least not with others. It was a life of total alienation except for a few other lepers who would no doubt be okay hanging out with you. It often and most often led to an early painful death. It's a fitting picture of sin's effect upon us. But before we try to connect the dots and say, well, you know, this is how leprosy affected them and this is how sin affects us, I think you can actually do that yourself. We want to focus on the seriousness of his situation, the hopelessness that he had to have felt until he heard about Jesus. So as he is struggling and suffering and, and wondering, is there hope at all? Well, he hears that Jesus is coming around and he finds his way to Jesus and he does something that was actually against the law. If you were suffering from leprosy, you weren't allowed to enter into the town. If you broke that law, you weren't allowed to approach someone who was walking toward you in the town. So if you saw someone coming, you're not supposed to be there, but you've come anyway. Now you're walking down the street. You see someone coming, you have to cross the street, you have to cover your face, and you have to cry out, unclean, unclean. In the midst of that, this guy's broken the first law, he's broken the second law, he doesn't seem as concerned with the legal system as the, well, seriousness of his personal situation. And so it should be. The only time it's legit to break the laws of man would be to, well, achieve the higher goal. And in this case, the higher goal is connecting with God. Obedience to God always trumps obedience to man. So if man says, do this, and God says, never do that, well, then the, the never do that has got to stand. Well, he comes to Jesus, he worships him. He humbly declares in faith, if you are willing, you can make me clean. 
It's interesting he doesn't say, I know you can heal me, although cleansing would bring with it healing. It's not the physical thing he's as concerned about as the spiritual one, the, the alienation he experienced because of his defilement. That was the, the major issue for him. He wanted to connect with God in God's temple and with God's people. He wanted to worship and fellowship among the saints of God. So he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus' response, take note, addresses every need. He doesn't just say, be cleansed. No, he reaches out and meets his greatest physical need, human touch. You see, no one who wasn't already a leper would ever risk touching a leper. And knowing Peter and the guys, I can't imagine they weren't like, should we tackle him? Look, oh my gosh, he's reaching out to him. They would have never done it. And no one who saw it would have approved of it because there's always that chance that somehow his defilement will pass to you. By the way, there are many warnings in scripture about not contacting defilement because the way it works is if someone's defiled and you connect with them, you will end up defiled. Uh, it, the, the picture is there's a gallon of clean, pure, drinkable water, and there's a gallon of sewage. You can't mix the two and say, well, now we have two gallons of drinkable water. Now you have no drinkable water because the sewage defiles the pure, clean water. And so it is with sin. And in this case, not sin in his case, but the leprosy itself. Jesus meets his need physically by touching him. And I'm sure there are many people today who just need human touch. Do you know, it was common in past generations to hug, you know, your family and to love them and, and not just to communicate over some device where like, you know, you're my friend and I unfriend you or can I refriend you? And those are no friends at all. That's just, that's just names on, a, on a, a list. But human contact, they've, they've learned through studies in the past, some of them done tragically and in bad situations, but they still learned that if you have an orphanage with 100 babies and you have five workers, and, and uh, by the way, my brother adopted a little girl out of an orphanage like that in China where they changed their diapers on a schedule. You know, when we were had our boys and then, you know, and, and I'll be honest here, Pam changed their diapers and, uh, and, and, but nevertheless, we didn't do it on a schedule like, oh, two o'clock probably should change the boys' diapers. The moment you smelt it and you smelt it, then uh, you changed it. But, but anyway, they go to this orphanage and there's just rows and rows and rows and rows of kids. And those who had more physical contact did better. They, they matured mentally, emotionally, and socially, in every other way, more naturally. And those who lacked human contact often had serious uh, issues related to that lack. So in this case, here's a guy who no one's touching and Jesus reaches out. He could have just said, be cleansed, but he reaches out and he touches him. In the midst of that, he affirms him verbally. And, uh, you know, he touches him, uh, taking care of the physical need. He affirms verbally, I am willing. Now, I don't know how long it was from the touching and the affirmation to the actual cleansing, but I got to say, he had to be filled with anticipation a joy knowing those words, I am willing, mean he's about to be cleansed. And miraculously, he's cleansed of his leprosy. No, leprosy was incurable, you should know that. Yet God's law, I believe it's in Leviticus 14, provided for um, the, the, a process to be restored to fellowship once you could show your leprosy had been cleansed. Get this, incurable, and yet the law says once you're cured of it, here's what you need to do. Why? Because it all foresaw what Jesus would come and do. 
you could go to the priest, you could show him that the leprosy was cleansed, they would, they would kind of separate you out still for a season, check you again, same thing, check you again, and then ultimately you could be restored to full fellowship among the people of God. Well, that's exactly what happens for him. That's why Jesus says, don't tell anyone. It's not like he doesn't want his friends or family, those who would have known him, to know what God had done for him, but he didn't want to draw more crowds. Jesus was never about getting the crowd. He was always about ministering to the crowd, and the crowds were already growing, so much so that he'll say this kind of thing often, don't tell anyone well, go home and tell your family, but, but just you and your family, or go home and let the neighbors know, but, but your friends, yeah, okay, your friends, but don't tell everybody. And the interesting thing is, in almost every case, when he says, you keep this quiet, they go out and shout it from the housetops. <laughs> At the same time, he tells us, what I told you in the house, shout from the housetops. And we're like, Jesus is so awesome, he loves you. And it's like... <laughs> We, we don't want to really get out there and draw attention to ourselves. It's not about us. It's about him, and it's about them. So Jesus told them, tell no one, listen, Mark 1, and I'll reference Mark and Luke because they, they, they track on most of these stories, and we learn from them that Matthew's not really concerned with getting them all chronologically, but it says he went out to proclaim it freely. Tell everyone to us, Few of us actually do tell no one to him, and he went out and proclaimed it freely. Well, second uh, little story here and, and miraculous encounter here. Verse 5, Jesus had entered Capernaum, and a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Now, if the disciples were uncomfortable with a leper approaching Jesus, because they're hanging out, right? They would have been equally uncomfortable with a centurion approaching him. Why? Well, a centurion is a Gentile. A centurion is a Roman. He's a Roman commander. He commands a hundred men. And so this guy approaches, but just like the leper, he comes humbly he acknowledges Jesus. He's like, Lord, my servant's paralyzed. He's dreadfully tormented. And it's interesting because he makes no demands. We saw in our study of the Sermon on the Mount that a Roman soldier could tell you if he was carrying his pack, hey, carry my pack for a mile. And Jesus' instruction to his disciples was go an extra mile, take it another mile. That gives you opportunity to answer the question, why would you do this willingly when I just forced you to do it a few moments ago or an hour ago, however long it would take to walk a mile with a Roman soldier's pack? The point is it was an opportunity to be obedient to Jesus and to share with that soldier that, hey, Jesus commands me to do it. He cares for you. I'm going to you know, do whatever he tells me to do. So he doesn't demand, as some try to say, you must or can or should today. Instead, he comes humbly. He pleads. And again, he pleads for another, his servant. A servant, a slave in this case, in the Roman Empire was considered property. They were bought and sold. They didn't have any rights. They didn't have any possessions. They didn't even own their children. Not that we own ours, but they belong to us and we're responsible for them. So here's a man that for all his life has told people what to do and he comes to Jesus and he doesn't say, hey, I need you to take care of something for me. He's like, Lord, my servant, paralyzed, tormented. And so Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. I love that. He didn't even ask, Lord, will you come heal him? He just told him what the problem was. And I found that as we share with the Lord what, well, what we're going through or what those we love are going through, we can trust him to tell us what he's willing and wanting to do. So 
at this point, he just says, I'll come and I'll heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. He believed that Jesus had authority, not over, only over sickness and disease, but over time and space, that he could simply speak from here and it would happen over there, that he could speak now and it would happen immediately. And, and so he is exhibiting a faith. Jesus is going to testify that he hasn't seen yet, even among his own people of Israel. Now, he says in verse 9, explaining why he believed such things, he says, I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to this one, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. There's an age-abiding principle that's illustrated here. This isn't the principle, but this is the illustration of the principle, and that is those who exercise authority must be under authority. And you should know, even Jesus said, I do always those things that please the Father. Though he was the Son of God and God the Son, he was submitted to the Father. Why? Because he'd taken on flesh and he chose to trust the Father to provide. And he trusted the Father to guide, and, and he prayed to the Father and asked wisdom from the Father, and, and he even pled with him, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, he says, but yours be done. That's submission, you see, and if Jesus can submit to the Father, though both are God, one God, three persons, don't have time to go into the whole Trinity thing, we'll walk that road together another day, but for now, important to see it. He's saying, I tell this guy what to do when he does it. I tell this guy what to do when he does it. I know you can do the same. And so when Jesus heard it, verse 10, he marveled. And I love that. I heard some time back, want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. And, uh, you know, hey, Lord, I'm going to do this. And you just watch this and Hey, by the way, I could use a little help on it, but no, just tell him your plans, he'll crack up. And if you want to make him marvel, just walk by faith. Actually live as if you believe what you say you believe. And that's what's happening here. This guy believes Jesus can simply speak the word and wherever his servant was, his servant would be healed. And so he says he marveled. And said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I've not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you, many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to centurion, Go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. I want to say, if you look at what the leper said, if you're willing, you can. And what this guy says, I know that you can, because even I can command. I just can't command and do what you can do. And so you put those together and you see the importance of coming humbly. They both did. Of asking, not demanding. They both did. Of affirming what he's able to do, but letting him decide what's best to do. That's exactly what's taking place here. It had to be troubling to any religious leaders that were hanging out when he starts talking about the sons of the kingdom ending up in outer darkness. Why? Because he's addressing those who thought because they were of the Jews, um, you know, ethnically and such, that somehow that made them right with him spiritually. That's like the idea, and it's less common today. When I was young, America was considered a Christian nation, so if you weren't a Muslim or a Buddhist or something like that, you were considered a Christian. That's still the case in many places in the world today. But, but you know, then, well, how do you know you're a Christian? Well, we go to church every Christmas and every Easter. 
And once the Super Bowl fell on one of those or something, you know, that kind of nonsense. And I still went. I had my, my I watched it on the, you know, during the service. But the, the point is this. I know the Super Bowl can't fall on those, so don't write me a note and say, you know, fix that one. It's, it's just an illustration. When I don't think through them, they're not always as clear as they will be someday when, like, someone younger is doing this. Uh, anyway, two down and a few to go. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, verse 14, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. Dr. Luke tells us she was sick with a high fever. And while it doesn't say she had an infection or this could have been life-threatening, when the doctor says it's a high fever, that's more serious than when, you know, Matthew, a tax collector, uh, points out she had a fever. Here's what's so important to us today. Jesus simply rebukes the fever. Matthew says he touched her. Both are true. And there are many places, if you look at the multiple gospel accounts, where one will say one thing and another will say another. And those who are looking for contradictions will say, aha, a contradiction. But there's no contradiction. One saying he touched her. The other saying he spoke lovingly to her. And, uh, and, and so either way, the fever left her. And I like that. By the way, immediately it says, she arose and served them. I would think this would always be our response. If God does something great for us, we're laid low or just, you know, wiped out and, and he revives us and clears our head and energizes our spirit that we would get up and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Who can I minister to? Well, she saw him. He, his disciples, they were all right there. And she began to serve them. Well, we learn from the first two that there's nothing too hard, too great for our Lord. We learn from the third, no need is too small. Both are important because some of us are facing or will face at some point some problem physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, you know, relationally that is so great, we can't imagine how we're going to get through it, how we're going to survive it. We're going to get through it and survive it because we have him. And we just come to him and say, Lord, you know. There are times we don't even know what to pray. He says there's just groanings that, that, that he can understand and interpret. And, and he's like, I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. I've been there. So we learn there's nothing too hard for our Lord. And then we learn there's nothing too small for our Lord. Because some of us face huge things and we're like, I don't know if even the Lord, I know well he could, but I don't know if he will. Ask him, ask, seek and knock. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. We learned that in our prior studies in the Sermon on the Mount. And then with something like a fever, I know that some of you are really this way. You're like, well, you know, there's so much real suffering in the world and my problems comparatively, they're so small. I feel guilty even bothering the Lord with it. I'm not saying I do that. I get a hangnail. I'm, Lord, I'm saying, Lord, I, I'm having trouble with this hangnail, you know? And he's like, cut that off and cut it out. But uh, anyway, the, the point I'm making is an important point and, and that, well, nothing's too hard and nothing's too small. Those of us blessed by and healed by and cared for by our Lord should take time to thank him and then to serve others in his name. So we have another, an ex another example of those who were touched and healed and blessed by our Lord. When evening came, word was getting out. Why? Because they entered into Capernaum, and, and that's where he had healed the centurion's servant. So the, the Gentiles are getting word, hey, this guy isn't just caring for Jews. He cares for Gentiles, too. He even healed a Roman soldier's servant. 
So at evening, they brought him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word, and he healed all who were sick. And I love that word, all. Some want to say, well, he has to heal all. He doesn't, but he can heal all. And in this case, he chose to, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. The crowds grew, the needs were great, but Jesus was willing and able to free the possessed and heal all who were sick. This quote from Isaiah takes us back to a passage familiar to us. We often quote it during communion, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. It's so important. The context clearly in Isaiah is spiritual. And and you need to get that because the principle when we're interpreting the scripture is one interpretation, many applications. That means for Isaiah, as he's writing those things, it meant one thing, that our transgressions, our iniquities, our, our peace was all about him and what he would do for us. But Matthew takes it, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he applies it to physical healing. Some have misunderstood and said, well, then it always applies to physical healing. Well, it did that day. But to say every, everyone who's sick, God has to heal them, that's just foreign to Scripture. Jesus will later come to a, a place where there's just a multitude of people who are suffering and struggling, and it's at the pool of Siloam. And, and there was this, this rumor that if you got down into the water when the water stirred, if you were first in, you'd be healed. So there was this competition set up, and, and the people most able to get to the water were most likely to be healed. The person with the least possibility of getting there had no possibility of being healed. And Jesus shows up that day and he doesn't say, hey, come on, all y'all, we're gonna heal everybody. Well, no, instead he goes to one man and he says, do you wanna be made whole? It, it's so important to see it. He could have healed everybody that day, but he didn't. And so all I'm saying is we we can't take an illustration and say this is how Jesus is going to do everything. This proves Jesus wants to heal everyone. That's foreign to scripture, but Jesus can heal everyone. And that's the real point here, that there's nothing too hard. There's nothing he can't do. He has the right. He has the might. He has the authority and the power to do what no one else can do. Well, there's a short interlude here in verses 18 through 22. And then we get to the last couple of miraculous encounters with our Lord. This one deals with the demands of discipleship. Two men, very different situations. We read in verse 18, take a look with me. When Jesus saw, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. While the disciples were no doubt preparing to leave, a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The age-abiding principle illustrated here is that all who follow Jesus or choose to follow Jesus must first count the cost. He's saying, if you're coming with us, you need to know this. We have no reservations on the other side of the lake. And uh, actually what awaits us over there is gonna be pretty radical. And so he's saying, look, I don't even have a place to lay my head. I don't have anything and I don't have anyone except these guys. So if you wanna come, you need to consider all of that first. Well, The cost, it turns out, is great. We saw it in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll be hated and rejected and persecuted and falsely accused and and all of that because you love and are following and representing him. And he says, here's how you're going to deal with that. You're going to love them and pray for those and do good to them and, and such things. Well, another of his disciples, 
This would not be one of the 12. This would be those who were gathering themselves and attaching themselves to him, saying, hey, I want to follow you, Lord. I, I want to be your disciple. I want to become like you and learn from you. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, and this is one of the stranger responses to somebody who sounds like he's, you know, I got a funeral to attend to here first. He said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Well, he means the dead spiritually, take care of the dead physically. But it almost seems as if he's unconcerned with this man's loss of his father. And nothing could be further from the truth. This man's de desire to uh, bury his father, well, it has to do with something entirely uh, unrelated. At least we wouldn't have thought of it. Now, it may be that his father isn't even dead yet. That's a real possibility. And so I would think in that case, he will most certainly resist the burial. And so, um, yeah, you see. So, so uh, if, if he was sick and near death or had died recently but hadn't been actually buried formally, well, that's a possibility as well. Wealthy people, Famous people, kings and royalty of other types, they often would be put in a sarcophagus. It's, it's sort of a very fancy looking box, large like our coffins, and they would put them in somewhere visible. And uh, for a season after their death, people could walk by and there would be carvings in it. And it kind of looked like, it, you know, it had a little part that was like a roof, you know. So it looked like somewhere to hang out and dwell. But the point is it was a time to honor him for that season. Then ultimately he would be entombed. They didn't put people in the ground. They weren't digging graves what they were doing is putting them in tombs. They used caves and others. You know, Jesus was buried in a rich man's what? Tomb, right? And uh, it sounds like such a great sacrifice. They were expensive, these tombs. But of course, Jesus was only borrowing it for three days anyway. But uh, in our story here, it's possible that his father had died or was about to die. And so he, he's saying, well, we need to deal with his burial and get it all settled. Why? The inheritance could not pass to the son until every wish of his father related to his death, his presentation, his ultimate entombment had occurred until it had all been finished. So if that's the case, and it's probable here, based on Jesus' response, that what he's saying is, listen, I need to secure my inheritance first. Now, no one's going to use those words when they're talking to the Lord. But, you know, it's actually true that people say, you know, once I get the raise, or once I become the manager, or once I work my way up to this, then I'm going to really dedicate some serious time to the Lord. I've even had people tell me, you know, if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to give a bunch of money to Calvary. I'm like, why don't you just give a little money now just in case you never win? But uh, that's always personal. I never say it to the group, although I just did, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, the point is here is that, that Jesus isn't being callous or cruel or unconcerned or uncaring. He's exposing, as he so often will and does, the motivation behind this guy's hesitation. And, and so to one, he says, listen, you need to count the cost. To the other, he says, you need to figure out if you want to come or if you want to stay because we're about to go. Well, now he gets into the boat, verse 23, our last two um, little, little snippets. His disciples followed him. Suddenly, a great tempest arose on the sea. So the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep, and the disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? 
And he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. So the men marveled, saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Mark and Luke both tell us that the boat was filling with water. Here it says the boat was covered with the waves. It might be clearer to know the waves weren't just passing over it. They were dropping into it. So they're legitimately freaking out, legitimately afraid that they just might drown. Well, both Mark and Luke tell us as well, though, that he had said, let's cross over to the other side. And I want to say when Jesus says we're going from here to there, it doesn't mean let's go out in the middle of the lake and drown. That was never going to happen. And why is that important to us? Because we're on a journey with him that's going to end in heaven. If you've come through the narrow gate and you're walking the narrow road, that narrow and difficult road, your destination and your end destination will be in his presence in heaven and then of course when he returns you return with him new heavens and a new earth will be with him it is always about being with our lord so in this case he says hey we're going over there and he gets some rest the storm is rising and jesus is resting and the disciples are freaking out so they wake him up probably the first good sleep he's had in a while, and, and, and they're rowing, and he's resting, and they wake him up, and in the midst of it, they're like, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Jesus rebuked the winds and sea, and they obeyed him. One of the gospel writers tell us he rebuked the fever that, that Peter's mother-in-law had, and in the story we're about to conclude with, he's going to rebuke some demons, and, and uh, in every case, he has control. If it's disease, he can handle it. If it's, if it's you know, nature, he's got that. If, if it's demonic, he can handle that as well. So the great storm ceased, and we read, there was a great calm. I love that. Great storm, great anxiety, great fear, and now a great calm, not just of the sea, but I would think in every disciple. Application abounds for life is filled with many, many storms. Well, when he'd come to the other side, last story, to the country of the Gergesenes, I prefer Gadarenes because it's easier to say, and I don't know why one says this and the other says that, except to make it hard on people like me there met him two demon possessed men if you're familiar with the story you already know the other gospel accounts say there was one who's right the answer is they're all right he says there were two mark and luke are going to say there were one why they're focused on the one he must have been most dominant or most threatening or most verbal whatever's going on here there's no contradiction I bought a book when I was a young Christian and just starting to teach called A Hundred Apparent Contradictions. I don't know if it's still in print, but if it is, you should really get a hold of it. It deals with all sorts, different types of con apparent contradictions. And it turns out that in the majority of cases, common sense will tell you what's true, uh, th given that you know the scripture, of course, uh, that helps a lot. But even if you don't know that the other gospel writers say something different or someone comes and says, hey, this guy says this and this guy says this, common sense says one is giving us more information than the other. One's filling in blanks that to him was important. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we're, we're looking here at Matthew, formerly a tax collector. So he's always giving us detail. You know, there was one man, according to Mark and Luke, but he says, there were two. Why? Because that's twice as much taxes. And so, uh, you know, he's still thinking like a tax collector. But at this point, it says, two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs. Listen, they lived, and I'm going to focus on he because, well, that's, that's kind of where all this goes. They were living, I'll focus on them, I guess. They were living in a graveyard. 
exceedingly fierce that no one could pass that way. As you read the three accounts, here's what you get. Naked, tormented, self-destructing, crying out, cutting himself with stones. The home a graveyard, chains unable to hold them. Alienated from common comforts, the pleasures of community, possessed, tormented by a legion of demons. A Roman legion was 6,000. Were there that many demons in these men? Only God knows. But there are 2,000 swine that they're about to be cast into. So to the Jews, he was unclean. To the Gentiles, he was crazy and feared and, well, helpless and hopeless until Jesus shows up. Suddenly they cried out, not the two men, the demons within. What have we have to do with you, son of God? Jesus, you son of God. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Take note, demons know who Jesus is because he created them. They once worshiped him at the throne of God. Satan himself, who leads the demon hordes, was a worship leader in the throne or at the throne of God. A worshiper of Jesus before he fell, before he rebelled and took others with him. They know that Jesus is their rightful judge and that the time is coming for him to judge them. And what they're saying is, isn't, you know, it's not right for you to torment this. It's not right for you to judge us. They're just saying, is this actually the time? Are you going to do it before the time? Because there is a time appointed. The day will come when they and Satan himself and the beast and the false prophet will be cast into Gehenna the lake of fire where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. They know him. They acknowledge him. They know he has authority over them. They know the day was coming when he judged them, casting them into Gehenna. And so a good way off from there, we read in verse 30, there was a herd of many swine and the demons begged him. Interesting. They begged him saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go away into the the many swine feeding, the herd of swine. And, And so he said to them, go. So when they'd come out, they went into the herd of swine. Suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Why? Because the demons like Satan who leads them, they come to steal, to kill, and destroy. They begged him, he permitted them. Then, verse 33, those who kept them fled. They went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, you would expect them to say, Lord, Heal us, cleanse us, forgive us, have mercy on us. But they don't, they beg him, not for his help. They beg him to depart from their region. I want to say this would be a sad and tragic ending if it was the end of the story. Let me read you two quick things and we'll pray and worship together. Luke 8, 38, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him, a lot of begging here, that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away. He's saying, Lord, I want to go with you. I want to travel with you. I want to be your disciple. He sent him away saying, listen, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. He says, go home and tell your family what great things God has done for you. He goes and he tells the whole city. So, you know, well, he, I'm sure he told his household. And he's like, I got to tell the neighbors. I got to tell Uncle Joe down the street. I got to go tell everybody. So he tells the whole city what God had done for him. I like that. He says, tell them what God has done, but actually it says he told them what Jesus had done because he knew 
who had touched and cleansed and, and healed and, and freed him. Mark 5, 19 says he had been demon-possessed. He who had been demon-possessed begged him, same word, that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said, go home to your friends. So Luke says to your house, Mark says to your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he's had compassion on you, and he departed and began to proclaim in, listen, Decapolis. It's a word we don't use. And so uh, 10 cities, it means. This guy no doubt goes home. We know he went to his house. We know he went home. We know he went to the city, to all his friends. And then he went on a 10-city road trip so he could tell all those people what Jesus had done for him. At the very least, everyone who knows us best should know not just that Jesus saved us back in the day or, or that he forgave us at this point or that he healed us at some point in the past. They should be hearing what Jesus is doing now. He didn't finish it all back then. He just got started. And we have a testimony, and I hear people saying, well, if that happened to me, I'd tell everybody. So it's not enough that you were dead and trespasses and sin and you're alive in him eternally. That's not a testimony that you were blind and now you can see, you were deaf and now you can hear, you were mute and now you're praising the Lord. Listen, your testimony is as radical as his. And you should just thank God that you were never in his position in the first place. But we all have an opportunity to testify in our own house, to our own friends, to our whole city, and to as many places as the Lord will take us. Lord, how grateful we are, knowing, Lord, as well I do, that you later traveled that same route. You followed those same roads. You went to the same 10 cities where this man went telling everyone he knew and people he was just meeting what you had done for him. How awesome, Lord, how radical that is. And I pray, Lord, if nothing else sticks, that we'll all leave remembering. There's nothing that you can't do. There's nothing too hard for you. No sin too great, no sickness too severe, no relationship too broken, no trial too great that you're not sufficient for it. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that we would trust in you and turn to you and come humbly and ask, well, willingly, Lord, what, what, what do you want to do, Lord? If you want to, I know you can. Do what's best, Lord. Do what's best in our lives, in our homes, in our fellowship, in our community. Please use us to speak to this oh-so-broken world. And Lord, help us as, well, he did to start at home and to start with those we have interaction with daily and then to spread the word, our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the world. And Lord, if there'd be anyone here today who's never given their life to you, convict them now of their sin and their need and convince them as you did us of your great love and your plan to forgive and transform and use them so that they will stand before you and hear, well done and enter in. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. If you've never given your life to him and you're ready to do that, would you raise your hand and hold it high so I can acknowledge you and pray for you and then pray with you? Why do I ask you to do that? So that you this day can leave this place absolutely sure that the one who gave his life for you has cleansed you and forgiven you of all your sin, lifted that burden of guilt and sin and shame from you and given you a brand new start, a brand new life, the life that he's always intended. Anyone this hour, anyone this service, anyone this moment, Lord, you're looking for hearts, reading hearts. You see those that are broken. 
You see those that are struggling. You see those that are suffering. You see those that are rebelling. And Lord, we just see one another and, and only what we allow one another to see. You see everything, Lord, and yet you still love us and so love us and so want us. So we offer ourselves afresh, we who know you, and we pray you'd continue to pursue those who've yet to come to. In Jesus' name, amen.